This audio fanfic is rated K+, which is the same as a movie rating of PG. Parental guidance recommended. This should be suitable for older children and adults. For more information on what the rating means, please go to www.esrb.com. I seriously think there's a curse on New Year's Eve. Or maybe just on me. Either way, it always seems to turn out miserably. Last year, I was buried in research, hoping to engulf myself in the blissful distraction of science. Until Darcy barged in at midnight and dragged me out of my office for a drink. The year before, I'd been a little more of an obvious wreck. Trying not to mope, but spending most of the evening watching self-indulgent Meg Ryan movies, eating mint chocolate chip ice cream, and trying not to wonder whether they celebrate the new year in Asgard, too. The year before that, I'd still been reeling from a breakup. Apparently, Christmas had seemed like the ideal time for Don to tell me that this wasn't working out, that he needed some space, which translated roughly to, I'm bored with this relationship and with you. And the year before that, well, you get the idea. But this year is going to be different. I know it. For one thing, I'm in a... Well, I wouldn't exactly call it stable when your alien boyfriend could get summoned to one of the eight other realms for some cosmic battle at any moment. But a happy relationship, at least. Even if he weren't the god of thunder, I still wouldn't deserve him. And I've started giving lectures at the university on einstein rosenbridges and the various theories, including my own, surrounding them. Although it all sounds so mundane putting it in academic terms after seeing the Bifrost with my own eyes. And I can never really articulate to my students why it's so awe-inspiring without sounding completely crazy. Science classes are so odd now that life on other planets and the existence of giant green rage monsters is an openly acknowledged fact. But I know that tonight will be special, because we're going to a New Year's Eve party at Stark Tower, of all places! Thor's already introduced me to Tony Stark, or the Man of Metal, as he calls him, but I've yet to meet the other Avengers. It's exciting, but also kind of terrifying. I'm intimidated and awkward enough with just one superhero in my life. Six in one room together sounds a bit dangerous. Still, it was so nice the way Thor's eyes lit up at the prospect of introducing me to his new friends. How eager he seemed. And of course I said I'd go with him. I've been a little worried about him lately. It's been a while since I've seen him so enthusiastic. So maybe tonight is just what he needs to forget his troubles for a bit. Sometimes I want to ask him if he's okay. If there's anything I can do. But what can you really say to someone that's lost half of their family in the span of a few days? And while he talks of Frigga often and fondly, he never mentions his brother. So I do not bring him up either. I know he thinks about him, though. When we pull up to Stark Tower, I'm driving in my embarrassing rattletrap minivan, since Thor still doesn't have a firm grasp on Midgardian traffic laws. It's already swarming with people. I smooth my hair nervously. I don't wear dresses very often, or very much makeup. But tonight is different, and I have made more of an effort. I'd felt confident walking out the door, but now, surrounded by all these socialites and celebrities, I'm having flashbacks of middle school. Of a mousy girl with braces and a distinct lack of social skills, who wore her father's oversized glasses even when they made her eyes hurt, just so that she could feel close to him again. And maybe, just maybe, she could see the world as he did, as an intricate puzzle full of wondrous possibility, begging to be solved. That girl who had always tripped over her second-hand boots. That girl who had spent most of her lunch periods buried in scientific journals because nobody else seemed to understand why string theory was so exciting whenever she tried to explain it. The girl who had always felt out of place at parties, like she did not deserve to be there. College had been kinder to me, I remind myself. I had learned to make friends with like-minded people, more or less, and outgrew my awkward face. Yet that mousy, gawky little kid is still locked away somewhere, resurfacing occasionally at the most inconvenient moments. Such as this. Thor takes my arm gently and says, You look stunning, Jane. Gods, why do I always blush like a starstruck teenager around him? His easy smile says that he absolutely means it. I look him over in his new suit. For some reason, I still can't get used to him wearing Midgard clothes. And say, You clean up pretty nicely yourself. 
He chuckles smugly as if to say, I know, and I give him a reproving look for his lack of modesty. We push through the throng together, looking for our hosts. Or rather, Thor creates a wide path for me to follow. There are hundreds of guests packed into the lobby, drinking champagne and chatting. But Thor leads me over to the elevator, shows his invitation to the attendant, who blanches realizing who he is, and we ride all the way to the penthouse at the top. Come on, relax. This is nowhere near as terrifying as Asgard. You've met Odin for crying out loud. Surely you can handle these people. I try to take a deep breath. <sighs> Tony Stark's penthouse is luxury itself. Sleek, modern, tastefully minimalist. Unlike downstairs, where the music blared until my eardrums felt like they were going to bleed, up here is more of an intimate, exclusive party for a few dozen. Oh look, the patriotic one is here. Come, let me introduce you. Thor says eagerly, grabbing my hand and weaving through the crowd towards a young blonde man. Thor's booming, jovial voice carries easily across the room, and the man looks up instinctively, smiling in recognition. He's handsome, clean-cut, not quite as burly as Thor, but nonetheless has a soldier's build, and something about his genial yet quiet manner makes him seem remarkably wholesome. Thor, good to see you, he says as they clap each other on the back. Happy New Year. I must tell you, my friend, in Asgard, we do not celebrate the passing of a single year. It'd be much like you mortals marking the passage of a week. However, I will never turn down the opportunity for festivity. Thor explains, grinning. Fair enough. Grins the blonde man. Jane, I would like you to meet my patriotic friend, the one they call Captain of this great land of yours. Thor says, beaming. I shake his hand numbly. Captain America, I stammer, flushing as if I'm meeting a damn celebrity, which I guess I am. It's an honor. Thank you, ma'am, but just Steve is fine, he says sheepishly. Nice tie, I blurt out, because I can't take my eyes off the ridiculous star-spangled tie he's wearing with his otherwise conservative formal wear. Oh, yeah, Christmas gift from Tony, Steve mumbles. To be honest, I can't tell if he's mocking me again or not. I shall return in a moment, says Thor. I believe I see another of our companions. Once Thor has left us alone, Steve Rogers offers me a drink, and I accept. So, you're Miss Foster, is all he says, scrutinizing me. He has the slightest hint of a Brooklyn accent. I blush. Has Thor talked about me before? Only a few dozen times a day, he remarks. All good things, ma'am, he adds, seeing my embarrassment. I can't tell whether I'm more bashful or gratified. You're a scientist, right? Yeah, an astrophysicist? You should talk to Dr. Banner and Stark, he says, rolling his eyes. Half the time, I swear, they're not even speaking English. I giggle, deciding not to point out the vast differences between our fields of study. There are so many things I want to ask him, but I don't want to be weird or intrusive. Like... What was your life like back in the 1940s? Do you know anything about the serum they used to make you practically invincible? Is it hard getting used to the new technology? Is New York really different from when you were growing up? But in the brief pause that ensues, he seems to have become pensive as well. 2014. He sighs, shaking his head. He seems amazed that the year even exists, let alone that he's lived to see it. Before I can reply, Thor is returned and he is dragging a slight, nervous-looking man with wire-rimmed glasses. He is as rumpled as Steve is neat. Banner, this is Jane Foster, Thor says. Jane, this is the scientist, Dr. Banner, also the one who becomes large and green when he is angry. Yes, nice to meet you, Dr. Banner, I say, shaking his hand and trying not to laugh at Thor's curious descriptions. The evening wears on and I meet the others, Natasha Romanoff and Clint Barton. Or, the spider in the bird-like one, as Thor describes them. Even Nick Fury makes a brief appearance, but he doesn't stay long. I sense that Dr. Banner does not care much for large gatherings, as he remains aloof except for when Tony and Pepper drag him back into their conversations. He plays the piano in the corner. Occasionally we give him requests, 